Welcome to chapter six. This is where we break out the marketing mix and we start looking at how value moves into a central point in our thinking. Now as marketers, we have historically thought of products as offerings. Uh, we very much focused around features and then thought about the corresponding translation of we create the feature the consumer finds the benefit. When we start talking about value offers, we're talking about co-creation. We're talking about looking across the whole of the marketing mix to see how we can make something in-house that is useful to a consumer to solve a problem, fill a need, meet a want. One of the keys to this though is that we don't have to provide a total solution. And when we look at value, one of the aspects that we're looking at here is both what is the value that will be inherent in the product as we provide it? What is the value that comes from the price, the promotion and the distribution? So value isn't just restricted to being created inside product, although that's one of our primary assets and one of our primary ways of doing it. It can also be enhanced by the use of the rest of the marketing mix. So an absolutely central idea here is that the mix is not four standalone components. It is a blend of all four elements. And the way we use those four elements makes a difference to the customer, to what the customer can access or what the customer perceives the initial offering to be. So, moving into value offers, critical thing that you want to be thinking about is your audience. Value is audience specific. And this is why there is such an emphasis on segmentation and an emphasis on the Ansoft matrix. Do you know this market? Does this market know you? This whole, do you have an existing market or are you going to a new market? Because if you're going to a new market, novelty alone could be a value benefit. If you're in an existing market, familiarity can be a value benefit. So you want to be very familiar with the needs and wants of your market. For those of you working with your social media accounts, one of the things that you'll also able to see is positioning helps build value. And what you can learn through looking at competitor and collaborator accounts, people who are also using similar hashtags, offering similar products to you, is how they're positioning the value offer. What is it that they're creating, they're making, that is useful to you? So the first thing we're gonna focus on is we're gonna talk about the mix. Overall, again, the marketing mix, you are familiar with its basics. The key part to the way that I present the marketing mix and what's important to the way the book is uh, presented and the way that the course approaches marketing and the marketing mix is that the mix is something we control, but the customer is the one who interprets. So we can come out and say, look, well, we, we made all the right decisions, but the customer doesn't go for it it doesn't matter that we made all of the decisions that we thought were correct if the customer is not buying in. If the customer is not engaging, then something hasn't worked. So we need to be looking at this. This is why I quite like the SIVA, Solution Information Value Access, uh, the Devon Schultz 2005 alternative mix as a complementary, not as a replacement, but as a means to go and say, Price, product, promotion, place, check, those are our controls. Solution, does it solve a problem? Information, does the consumer know about it? Value, is it worth the consumer's expenditure of energy, effort, time, and other? And access, can they get to it? And when they get to the product, can they even get the value out of it? So using both mixes is important. And I found them to personally be valuable. You may choose one or the other, or both, or a third mix. It's up to you. This is one of those areas where just 
the decision and control becomes yours. So, product theory. One of my favorite models in the entire of the book. And the product components and the total product concept. The total product concept is vital when we get into looking at the intangibility of an e-marketing product. When you're putting a photo onto a Facebook page, you're posting to Twitter, you're creating a short video for Instagram, you're creating a longer video for YouTube, you're pinning things to a Pinterest board. These are all intangible actions. These are all non-physical. What you're then looking at is what is the core benefit? What's central here that the customer is getting and how do we then use the actual and the augmented product to either emphasize or facilitate? So if you think about the actual product, the actual product starts being things like the image itself, its color composition, its uh, resolution, its size. There's a whole bunch of information around that. But that's not, people aren't buying in on a 500 pixel by 500 pixel image. They're buying what the image shows them or what the image lets their minds do, whether it's pleasure, information, knowledge, whatever it is. So you've got this whole buy-in and it's really prevalent when we start getting into looking at what is it we're offering across a social media platform when we're not offering anything physical. So, figure 6.1 in the text. We borrowed this from the Kotler and Roberto 1989 social marketing. If you do a social marketing subject with me, you will see us, you will see this model in use because it's a good model that was designed to address social change and social causes. It also really, really has a strong behavioral and attitudinal component. So this looks at the idea of we're not just selling things, we're selling outcomes. Now, what upgrades were added for us, for the book? Uh, we brought in the content, experience, service, and virtual goods components, and the idea of the object, where you have a very much uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy tea and no tea at once concept, but you have a virtual good, which is an object, and here it's listed as no goods. This is where you're not keeping it. This is where it's an image on a, that you scroll past. Virtual goods, they are stored, they're saved. The, it's the difference between this video is technically no goods, whereas the PowerPoint slide is technically virtual goods. It's probably less of a concern for you at this point as behavior and idea are the real heavy hitters that make the difference for us in e-marketing. So moving into looking at what is the composition of your product. Because the key to this is that you are looking at within a product offering, what idea does it use, what behavior does it require, and what does it do in terms of needing objects? Every product has those three parts. This idea component splits out into belief, attitude, and value. What this translates to is a, and it's not a 33% split. In order for someone to use your product, what do they need to know? For example, in order for someone to use a travel guide, travel guide about uh, Sydney, what do they need to know? What beliefs, facts, and knowledge? Well, to start with, they need to basically know how to access the travel guide. If it's an application, they need to know how to download it. They need to know how to use their phones. They need to know the background of, does it require a login? Does it require you to sign in with Facebook? Things that you need to know. You need to know how to access it. Then we come to the attitudes. Are people positively or negatively predisposed to what you're doing? Negative product consumption is a thing. Uh, it baffles me at times. But 
the phrase hate watch is still there. People who watch shows because the shows make them angry and they're seeking that anger. So the solution that they're after is to be angry. So they pursue things that make them angry. I, be honest, there's a lot of video games that are probably in that category for me. Attitudes are a manipulable element. Belief is a, a controllable element. Belief is information. It can be provided through promotion. Attitudes can be provided, and I emphasize, can be provided, or they can be persuaded. You can tell people whether they like something or not, and a lot of people will listen. A critic can tell you that this movie is a bad movie. You shouldn't like it. A critic can tell you that if you like movie X, you'll like movie Y. So we can modify belief and attitude. And there's a lot of work we do in social marketing, and so there's an existing body of literature around this concept of changing ideas. Values are the challenge. Values are the slow-moving, big-ticket items. This is the ethics, the morality. This is the person who won't use Uber or Airbnb because they don't like the business model that underpins it that they will pay extra to have a unionized person um, or they'll pay extra to use a checkout that has a person serving them rather than a machine. Again, values are slower moving, bigger, but they need to be compatible. If your value system is not compatible with what the product is offering in terms of the concepts around it, the product's gonna fail for you. You're not going to adopt it because it's going to be a cultural clash or a value clash. It won't work. So you can know all about it. You can be, you're unlikely to be positively predisposed, but you may even be positively predisposed, but it's against your ideology. You're not going to do it. Second category is behavior. What does someone need to do? What are the actions or tasks they need to perform to use your product? And if you think about Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for a moment, there's a one-off behavior of signing in. There's a recurring behavior of finding content. There's the behavior of knowing how to use the phone. There's the behavior of scrolling, checking the Instagram, these are recurring behaviors. People need to know how to recur, how to do the behavior twice. The behaviors, if your entire marketing campaign is based around discovery on a hashtag, you are assuming people are going to know how to find your image on a hashtag, which is okay, by the way. When you make that assumption, you are selecting for an audience who has a slightly higher skill level, a slightly higher engagement level. So what you're also wanting to do is look at, when I ask someone to behave in a certain way, what are the activities I'm asking them to undertake? You also wanna look back at your metrics. Do I have metrics that are based around people engaging in behaviors for my benefit? If I do, what is the exchange that I am asking? What do I expect them to get back in return for providing me, particularly around content where you are going and encouraging people to participate, to comment, to contribute. The classic, so tell us what you think in the comments. What does someone get as payoff for providing you that market research? So this is the thing, the behaviors that you're asking for incur costs, so they need to incur rewards as well. Lastly, and this one's less of a concern for us as an overall unit, uh, the extended product model works on the three levels of the experiential, the performed, and then the actual, the actual product. Is the actual product physical? Is there an object? Is it virtual? That uh, I'd love to say it's subject at this point, but it is digital, techno, it's computer mediated, or is there absolutely nothing? Is it just ideas, experiences, and memories? 
That becomes important because that modifies distribution. It blurs the lines between distribution and promotion. The more ethereal and intangible something is in terms of its product delivery, the more likely you are to see distribution channels being promotion channels. We will tell you about the idea as we deliver the idea. But there's also the element of if it requires physical behavior, then it's a physically mediated product. So someone to participate in viewing, you know, to be part of your community. So you've got a goal, you want to set up a community, you want to have community actions and engagements, and people need to go to places and do things, then that's a physical requirement. There is an object or a sequence of objects involved. So you want to really think about this in the terms of the product model because the critical part and the critical aspect is this is about a single product. Every product has an idea associated with it, a behavior associated with it, and the product itself, the actual product. Those ideas, so if we take something as classic as a utilitarian as a mobile phone, there is the idea of what a phone does. Well, it's a portable computer. I like them. I, you know, I have, I like being connected to uh, my friends and my colleagues. And but please don't call me. Belief, attitude, behaviors, texting, application use, object, the phone itself. If my product is an application. So it's a smart app for uh, paying your parking. Idea, behavior, object. Each of these things has their component part. Each element has a sub part. You need to be thinking in terms of what is the offering I'm creating? For those of you running your social media accounts, this is where the big question comes in. What is the idea of the content? What is it that you are offering? And we have a checklist for this then what are the behaviors you're requiring of someone to consume that? It's also possible if you're offering something with high complexity, that the behavior might be the decoding, the actual act of looking at this, consuming this content as a recurring behavior creates change in attitude, instills belief, maybe even works on re reinforcing someone's values. So we do have component parts for each product that needs to be thought about. And to that end, what you want to be doing is having a quick review of the offer you're making to the market against the product offer checklist. In order to consume the content you're making for your social media, what does someone, what does the idea someone needs to have? What do they need to know factually? What do they need to do in terms of feeling positively towards it? Are there ethical or moral positions that would be compromised by the content? What are we asking you to do? What's the startup? What's the first behavior? What's the recurring behavior? Now you'll notice in the subject, the startup behavior was signing up for an account. The recurring behavior is filling the account with content. And the last aspect to this is what is the substantive nature of your product? Is it physical, virtual? Is it Experiential, ethereal and tangible goes away, or can it be recalled, repeated, stored? What, are, what happens with this product when the user has finished consuming it? So think about these elements. They are critical ways of thinking. And this is also what this particular aspect is for, this is training. If you can think through what you're doing now in terms of the photos you're taking for Instagram, the words you're writing for Twitter, the videos you're recording for YouTube, the posts you're sharing, the content you're creating, the content you're curating, and particularly for curation, what is the idea and the behavior? Are you asking someone to go out to another site or stay on your site? What are you asking them to do? So you want to be thinking about this to explore these opportunities. Now you've got a chance to actually implement them. Because this is a real meta two steps back from 
um, how we usually operate marketing. Normally in marketing, it's like make a thing, sell a thing. This is what's the component of the thing. So as always, if you need me, it's the contact points, hashtag over Twitter or even Instagram. I might start searching for that. You can post me a photo as a question or contact me on the platform on Twitter, email or book a meeting to come see me.